owned by our institutions, 100% owned, and um, we don't serve any other uh, uh, institutions apart from research and education um, and some medical uh, uh, medical schools and stuff like that. But it all has to do with research and education. Um, I'm here to talk about OpenConnect, which is a platform that we developed. Uh, uh, we started actually in 2009, um, and it's a platform that allows you to create collaborative platforms using federation on one hand, a federated identity on one hand, and group stuff uh, uh, on the other hand. Uh, I'll begin with showing a video, hopefully it will actually work. Um, that will do sort of a uh, two minute setting the stage. Actually after that you can go and visit the other session that you wanted to visit, but uh, I will dive into some of the, of the uh, topics a bit deeper then. Fingers crossed. Open Connect, developed by Servnet, is an open source middleware platform that brings together institutions and service providers to radically simplify authentication and group management. With Open Connect's federated authentication, researchers, instructors, and students can use their institutional credentials to access their tools and services. Groups can be reused across tools and services as well. The group provider function offers users a single place to create groups that can be included in any service. OpenConnect is a powerful and robust solution, built especially with NRENs and large national or international collaborative organizations in mind. In the Netherlands, for example, SurfNet uses OpenConnect to run its hub and spoke federation service, SurfConnect. In just over two years, SurfConnect has seen an impressive growth. In the UK, JISC is piloting OpenConnect to create a collaborative platform around its JISC mail service, aimed at providing 1 million users with additional collaborative services. And in Australia, Arnet are trialing OpenConnect to provide a single shop front for Arnet services. Several e-science organizations will be building on their work. As these organizations have discovered, OpenConnect's technical foundation is both flexible and built to be reused. And OpenConnect's core is identity and group management. It has an application ecosystem that includes collaborative portals, a service app store, a provisioning API, and step up authentication. It boasts federated authentication and single sign-on functionalities based on SAML2. Both admins and end users can build on various sources to manage and combine group relations. The system also features self-service interfaces for end users to manage profile information as well as consent and access grants. And finally, its setup is component-based to allow for easy customization. More and more organizations are discovering the possibilities of OpenConnect. Install OpenConnect, build your own collaboration platform, and join our community. Help us stimulate and shape collaboration in research and higher education. And keep collaborating. So, so much for the PR. Back to the real thing. So basically, OpenConnect was born from the vision that we developed in about 2009. We have been running a national collaboration platform based on combination of uh, Microsoft SharePoint and Adobe Connect. Um, it was a very successful platform from our perspective. We had over 100,000 end users in there coming from all kinds of institutions. Anybody who was within our uh, constituency uh, could become uh, a user of the platform and could invite anybody else who wanted to who, who he or she wanted to collaborate with. Um, so it was really a platform that you could use to collaborate over institutional borders and also uh, uh, with other sectors, for example, with healthcare or with the government or, uh, of course, business. Um, actually, we even had a, a hockey club using it as a platform to run their, uh, their website um, because, well, we basically allowed anybody who was uh, able to use it could do basically whatever they wanted to do with it as long as this person was... Uh, could be held accountable for what he was doing. Um, so uh, about 100,000 users, about 20,000 collaborations in there. And actually, we had two kinds of groups in there. The 
sort of the institutional groups uh, that is mostly people running long lift lo or longer lift projects uh, like for example EU projects uh, 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 long running collaborations uh, but the most we had was the, the ad hoc collaboration small projects between a number of institutions where they wanted to do something and after three months actually the project ended they had done their work and they went on and uh, well um, mostly started a new group to do follow-up work or something like that um, well this was a very successful service however um, in the meantime, we had, and now I'm talking about uh, 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 2012, um, the Googles and the Microsoft of this world had emerged. Um, you could now get go online and get collaborative services there. Uh, you would get the box, Dropbox, this kind of services. And more and more our institutions were asking us to actually integrate these kinds of new services uh, that were deemed hip and stuff like that. And were also massively used uh, within our institution to sort of integrate that within this platform. Um, that was a bit of an issue because the openness of the platform was rather limited. And now I'm underestimating or under uh, 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 evaluating that really because, for example, SharePoint back in the day, especially, was a completely closed platform where you could not do anything. Um, the other thing was we were uh, uh, we as Surfnet are also running the National Identity Federation. Uh, pretty much what is in common here in the US. Uh, and we were heavily promoting that as a very uh, solid and, and reliable means of, of doing identity management and getting access to services. Uh, however, it proved pretty much impossible to get this platform to do federated identity. Um, back then, Microsoft was not doing anything SAML based in their platforms at all. Uh, that has fortunately changed by now. Um, so we had some custom built solutions, but that actually wasn't very satisfying either. Um, so at some point we decided, okay, we will need something else. Uh, we will turn this off at some point. Uh, and um, this was actually what led to, the, to this vision. We wanted a platform where you, could where you could loosely connect distributed services into a collaborative platform uh, using, on one hand, identity federations as a uh, means for doing uh, auth authentication. On the other hand, uh, using groups uh, to do authorization, but also stuff like group lookups, like... Uh, um, the ability to invite a group of people for your next uh, video conference meeting or something like that. So the basic three uh, building blocks of this platform, identity federations, uh, we're currently only doing SAML 2. Um, uh, of course, attributes play an important role. I will get to that uh, a bit later. Uh, the ability to create and manage groups. And we've provided an API uh, based on uh, what is called the Open Social API to uh, allow service providers uh, to actually get the group information and the group profile data from the platform and into their services. Um, by now uh, we are, but I'll get to that as well, but now we're working on implementing a, a number of additional APIs there. Uh, but back then this was one of the only viable uh, APIs that we could find. Um, and we added a piece of hardware, uh, sorry, hardware, uh, middleware, uh, uh, software that is, to actually make sure that you can sort of uh, combine the groups, the identities that are being used in the groups, and the, the federated identities uh, to combine them in a cohesive way so that you can actually, if somebody logs in and then you uh, into a service and then the service goes to the platform and asks, for example, give me the groups of this person, that you make sure that, for example, the identifiers are in sync uh, because otherwise you would have uh, um, created mayhem for these service providers. Um, and another thing we added was the ability to actually centrally manage a number of these things. Um, uh, so, well, I will show you later on as well. So, at, uh, at about 2012 as well, we open sourced the, the software that we have been using uh, in, in, within SurfNet uh, at that time. Um, and we called this Open Connect. So actually, although the video showed you uh, uh, SurfConnect being an instantiation of OpenConnect, in all reality it went the other way around. Uh, we first built SurfConnect and then open source parts of it, actually most parts of it, into the OpenConnect platform. Um, and actually there's currently uh, three variations, uh, three deployment types for the platform. Uh, and I will show you an example of, of all three. Um, first of all, you can use it as a collaboration platform where you actually use this to to uh, reuse groups uh, over a number of collaborative organizations 
combine these collaborative organizations for uh, these collaborative applications, sorry, for a collaborative organization like, for example, a, uh, a collaboration within uh, e-science. Um, we have a number of uh, very large e-science communities within, uh, in, within the EU, for example, biologists uh, um, uh, in humanities, and they can use uh, this platform to actually combine the, the services they have, and these can be uh, services that are gen generic cloud services like Google, uh, but it could also include their very specific services like their e-research services. They, uh, for example, the humanities people have large databases, large data sets that they would like to share between the, the, their community members, and that's something that you can do with this platform easily. The other thing you can do with it is you can uh, make a service delivery platform out of it. And that's actually what um, the people in Australia are doing with it. The RNET is the Australian NREN. Uh, Arnet has uh, it runs a number of services, including, for example, the Eduroam service. Um, but actually, they don't run that for uh, all people within the Australian Access Federation. The Australian Access Federation is a separate entity from Arnet. They also run uh, Eduroam, for example, for the New Zealand universities and for a number of universities and institutions in Australia that are not members of the Access Federation. Um, with the uh, OpenX platform, they can easily combine. Uh, both people coming from identity federations as well as guest IDPs and, and guest identity providers and combine them in one platform, still leverage groups that, com have, uh, that are combined from uh, people coming from all these IDPs, all these different IDPs, into one platform and deliver services that way. And, and finally, of course, in the Netherlands, we're actually doing both at the same time. We're both using this as a, as a uh, service delivery platform. We've actually tightly integrated the procurement of services in a, in a net plus kind of fashion, as, the, as uh, Incommon is currently doing that, and has tightly integrated that with the actual technical platform. So in, in the Netherlands, you can only do the net plus kind of services if you are actually connected to the platform and if you're in the federation as a service provider as well. Um, but we also provide uh, the same platform as a collaborative platform. Uh, one of the features for, of the platform is, for, for example, that you can combine external group providers into one platform and then have um, a service provider, a collaborative a service query, these multiple groups, these multiple group providers coming from multiple institutions of, or multiple collaborative organizations, and, and get one view of, the, of all the groups of this user. Um, that has proved to be very helpful for them. So the UK specific collaboration example was actually very intelligent, a very intelligent thing what they did. Um, they already had an existing service called Disk Mail, which is actually their sort of national mailing list service uh, that they have been running for quite a few years actually already. Um, the software was getting a bit old, and they had uh, decided that they wanted to update that. Um, at the same time, they came into contact with us and realized that um, they actually wanted to provide additional functionality on top of the actual mailing list service. I mean, yes, mail is still, I think, the predominant way of collaborating uh, between distributed users. Um, but for example, what do you do if you want to share a 10 megabyte file? Um, that is mostly a problem for uh, for users because 10 megabytes will not get through their mailing and will not end up in their mailbox. They, it, will, it will bounce. So there is a service called File Sender, which you may have known, uh, which you may know about, which actually allows you to use email to, to share uh, links to very large files. And actually, File Sender allows you to send files up to a terabyte size and share these between uh, participants. Um, so one feature could be um, use these, this mailing list group, uh, attach the file sender application to that, and make sure that if somebody tries to send a really big file, then it uses file sender instead of the normal mailing list. Um, the other thing you could imagine here is, for example, a calendaring application, where uh, in any collaboration, it's always very hard to find a, a date for a meeting. Well. Um, there is this uh, very nice open source tool called Foodle, which you can use to actually uh, combine, uh, uh, which you can actually combine with the group provider here. And so you can have and uh, send out an invite to your group, get your calendar date fixed, and uh, get your meeting done. Um, so that was the core idea of their uh, platform. They have trialed this, uh, this. The video, by the way, is from 2009, the beginning of uh, 2009, 2013, the beginning of that. Um, by now, they have, they have finished their uh, pilot. They were very happy with the generic setup they could do. They have, by the way, also included Simpa as one of the tools for actually doing the group stuff, uh, doing the email stuff. 
uh, where they've sort of ditched their previous listserv uh, uh, software. Um, and they're actually now waiting for uh, JISC to get its act together to uh, get the project to, so that they can actually do the production version of this, uh, of this uh, platform that, that they want to build. And as I said, in Australia, the Arnet folks have done a service delivery platform. I already talked about that uh, quite a bit, so I'll, I will skip that for now. In the Netherlands, um, we're using this mostly as a collaborative platform and as a service delivery platform. Um, this is a lot of uh, blah, blah. Where you can do uh, collaboration, um, basically three components are, uh, are important there. Authentication groups and portals. Um, uh, authentication to leverage the institutional ID of the users. Um, we have facilities for doing uh, guest access as well. We actually provide a social to SAML gateway as part of the platform, uh, so that you can, uh, so your guests can actually use Google or Yahoo or whatever to to participate in groups. Uh, end users can manage their own groups. Um, uh, these, these can be uh, ad hoc groups, but they can also be collaborative, uh, oh, sorry, uh, institutional groups. Uh, and institutions uh, or large virtual organizations can hook up their own group providers to the platform as well. Um, and uh, using portals, you can actually bring together these distributed applications. One of the, one of the issues that the end users face in a, a world where you have campus services and cloud services and stuff is that you need some way, some means of bringing together uh, the whole set of applications that is available for them. Uh, and by, by using portals, you can actually uh, do that. I will show some examples later on. Um, and as, a, as, uh, uh, as I said as well, um, using it as a service delivery platform allows us to actually combine the procurement of services and federation of services to, to combine that into one service delivery platform make it like a, a very easy one-stop shop scenario for our institutions to actually get them services and also to get some insight into, uh, okay, is this service, will this service work from a technical perspective with whatever setup I have, but also is the, how is the procurement and the licensing part uh, being done? And typically within institutions, this is, these, are complete, these are two very different um, uh, sides of the organization, so the technical people know how to deal with identity federation, but are clueless about the people who actually do the procurement and the licensing, and vice versa. Um, well, we have sort of combined that into one platform and, in, and also into one app store, where you can actually uh, easily see the, the whole view of the state of this, uh, of this service. It's a bit smaller than I had hoped, but anyway. <laughs> Um, this is the service dashboard that we provide for our institutions. And basically, you can see uh, I'm here logged in as, uh, as myself, and actually, we're a surfnet. We're not really an institution, so most of these services are not really interesting for us. But anyway, it gives you an, an idea of the kind of stuff that is in there. Um, uh, it ranges from, from publishers to actually collaborative services like Google and Adobe and Cisco WebEx and stuff like that. Um, we provide detailed information. Uh, this is, for example, a, a, a small uh, SME in the Netherlands that is providing a group collaboration service called Edu Groepen. Uh, Groepen is Dutch for groups. So, um, and actually, on the on the far left, left for you guys, right? Well, <laughs> whatever. In green, <laughs> it uh, informs uh, the, the the person that actually the license is okay, and uh, and also that it is for this uh, application is possible to buy additional group licenses. Because that's another area we've been exploring uh, uh, the ability to, for, for example, faculty or a specific group of people within an organization to buy additional licenses on top of sort of the basic service that is being procured by the institution as a whole. So you get sort of a, a freemium model where uh, everybody gets, uh, say, 10 megabytes of storage by default, but uh, as faculty, you can decide, okay, for this service, we wanted to use this as the collaborative service for our entire faculty, so we want another uh, 50 megabytes per user uh, on top of that. Well, that's something that we can actually provide with this platform. Um, it informs you about the attribute release policy of this, uh, of this service, and it provides you with additional info on uh, where you can actually get support, uh, where you can find additional information, and it is a pity that it is missing, but should this service provider also have published its privacy policy uh, and its end-user license agreement, then these, these would have also been here. 
Um, so it's just basically one overview of, of, of everything you would want uh, from the perspective of the institution. The same goes for e-science services. Of course, there is no license involved in the e-science bit uh, here. In this case, it's actually also an international service being provided via Edugain for the Clarion community, which is a collaboration, virtual organization in humanities. Um, and actually, it has a much larger attribute release policy, as you can see, no license, and again, some information on uh, where you can get support and, and find more information on this application. So for collaborative organizations, groups are actually the core of their collaboration. So making sure that you can actually uh, leverage that for your application, that's the core business of this platform. Um, and on top of that, that makes it actually much worse when you try to leverage groups. Most of these groups in these organizations are dynamic and international. So you must have some central means of, of uh, managing and registering your group members and your, and your groups. Um, the next thing you want to do uh, is make sure that all your services can actually consume these group memberships uh, in an easy fashion um, and uh, making sure that you don't have to do too much interconnects. Um, for, uh, in our experience, for most uh, collaborative organizations, unless they are doing the, what we call the hard sciences like the physicists or the, uh, well, that kind of folk who run their services anyway, um, if you try to sort of get a humanities person to do federation, uh, that's going to be a very interesting experience, I can tell you. Um, so what we wanted to do is create one platform where a moderately technical person would be able to manage uh, the service connections and the identity provider connections. Um, so that is one of the things that the platform provides. And of course, the last thing is you actually want to use attributes coming from people and use group memberships to actually do authorization because in the end, that's basically what you want. You want to make sure that people can get into their wiki space, can use XYZ because they are the admin of that. Uh, well, um, and that's one of the other things that you, that you can actually manage with the platform as well. Uh, you can manage attribute release policies. Um, you can uh, reuse uh, rights and roles that have been uh, uh, submitted. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, collaborative organizations often need very different attributes as compared to what the default identity provider uh, gives you, if the, if the identity provider gives you anything at all. Um, so we have a very basic means of uh, setting these attributes, and we're actively collaborating with people like the co-managed folks, uh, which is one of the many hats of Ben here in the room, um, to make sure that you can actually have uh, external uh, uh, attribute authorities uh, add attributes into the login stream when you go from the when you log into the via the platform, log into the actual service, uh, which would allow a virtual organization to also centrally manage additional attributes for the collaborative organization. So two example cases that we that we ran uh, uh, actually last year uh, um, is uh, one in e-research and one in e-learning. Uh, the WeNMR project is actually uh, a collaboration, a pan-European collaboration around structural biology. Um, these people actually share large data sets, but also share, for example, computational time at the European Grid Initiative, uh, where they actually run models and stuff like that. And they wanted one place and one easy means of integrating all their stuff and providing it to their, uh, to their participants. Um, and the other example is the Virtual Campus Hub, uh, which actually was a, a project, uh, again, EU-funded project which wanted to create a virtual campus uh, over four institutions in four different countries within the EU. Um, I will go into both projects in more detail now. Um, so basically what we NMR provides is an interface to cloud grid and, and high performance computing, uh, again using a, a portal for their collaborative uh, organization for all participants in their organization. Um, and actually in the back, it's EGI. Uh, the European Grid Initiative is a is a sort of service organization funded by the EU that provides uh, these kinds of resources to different uh, uh, um, collaborative organizations throughout Europe. Um, but the big problem is, of course, most of these resources are so-called non-web. Uh, so you need to log in with, say, SSH or certificates or stuff like that. 
Um, so one of the key things that uh, we and MR folks did was to build a portal that they hooked up to the SurfConnect platform that could actually do the translation and make it m very easy for their users to actually go from the federated identity or the guest identity because they also have a lot of uh, people still that are not members of any identity federation. Um, and sort of take that uh, identity, uh, um, repackage that into a certificate and make sure that they could actually use the services that the EGI provide. Um, we actually helped them with um, uh, federated identity and implementing that into their platform. Um, we are reusing their groups, or actually they're pushing their groups to our platform so that they can then be reused to, do, for example, get to uh, Google Docs and you reuse the same groups. Um, and we mostly helped them with setting up uh, the connection to EduGain which, is the, uh, which was the pan-European interfederation effort. But by now, I can happily tell you that uh, even the United States is a... <laughs> I see some, some laughs in the room, which is good. Even the United States is now a candidate member. Um, uh, as you may be aware, um, uh, many research, there, there's, there are many federations, uh, identity federations in academia, in, in most first world countries and in several uh, second and third world countries as well. And EduGain, which originally started, as I said, as a European initiative, is now a global initiative uh, uh, where there is a number of rules for how to interfederate between, say, uh, American uh, in common and the Dutch SurfConnect Federation. Um, well, in this case, uh, we worked with the Italian, the German, the French uh, federations to actually make sure that their, their institutions and their uh, and their researchers within these countries could get access to the BNMR research, uh, resources. And a similar pattern is actually what you see in this project, the virtual campus hub. Um, well, as it says, it, its main goal was to create a virtual campus. So um, get a number of resources from each and every campus, a learning system, a collaborative system, uh, they have a remote lab in there, uh, stuff like that, and sort of combine that into one set of preferably seamlessly integrated applications that would allow uh, students from each and every of these institutions to, to follow a curriculum which would actually be a mix of stuff that would be in Italy, stuff that would be in Denmark, stuff that would be in Sweden, and stuff that would be in the Netherlands. Um, that was sort of the ambition. Um, actually, uh, the, the Virtual Campus Hub uh, was is part of a bigger EU project uh, where these organizations provide learning for uh, learning resources around renewable energy. Um, so another very interesting part here was that they also collaborate heavily with uh, industry, uh, for example. Um, well, I will show you some of the results uh, in the, in the follow-up slides. Um, what they basically wanted to find out is how hard is it to actually do this? And especially how hard is this, how hard is this if we do this uh, using something like uh, EduGain, like an interfederation? They, they knew from the start that, that they technically could do a one-on-one -on -one between these four institutions, and it would probably be off, uh, well, they would definitely have been quicker uh, had they done it that way. But they also realized pretty quickly that that would never, ever scale. Uh, I mean, OK, adding a fifth institution would be OK, but by the time you add the 10th or the 20th institution, um, you would probably be uh, in a bit of a, a, a trouble there. Um, basically because these applications and these institutions, they need very, very uh, rigorous integration. They need not only do uh, authentication and authorization, like what you would typically do in any identity federation, but of course they also need to exchange information about, okay, uh, this student here uh, needs to do so, uh, needs to get so many uh, I don't know the English word, study points or something like that, what, uh, what you would call it. Credits. Credits. Uh, and, okay, we have something that actually gives him five credits, so, and how do you swap out that kind of information? So that's uh, that was another part of the of the work. We were not directly involved in that, but um, there was a much, much greater need for integration than only just identity and, and authorization. Um, however, we never got past the identity and authorization bit, because that already proved to be quite <laughs> challenging <laughs> to start with. Um, not in the least because it turned out that um, it were not only campus systems that we had to integrate and work with, but for example also a number of commercial identity, uh, commercial service providers were involved, because they were the providers of the learning systems. Um, and um, 
these were not completely up to, they were not completely ready to do interfederation in the way that higher uh, research and higher education tend, generally tend to do that. So that was an interesting experience both for them and for us. Um, basically they wanted sort of to lay the groundwork for uh, a future project where they would actually do this for real. Um, but in the end it turned out to be for real pretty, uh, pretty real as well because by now they actually are running this in production with uh, Although a small set of students, uh, it is actually now a real service for, for some of their students. So that was pretty good. Um, well, um, I had planned to give you a demo, but uh, apparently the portal is not available <laughs> for some reason. So you'll have to do with this very beautiful picture showing uh, sort of a very minified version of the where are you from screen that they use for their uh, institutions. So basically, the SurfConnect platform that we used here was the glue that brought together all these different applications and the different services, where we used Edugain as the actual policy glue uh, to combine all these services. We used the SurfConnect pl platform as the technical glue. And all these institutions and their federations hooked up stuff to the SurfConnect platform. Uh, we provided some international teams that could be shared between these applications as well. Uh, and it almost magically worked after, say, half of a year of, <laughs> of work. <laughs> so some of the results, uh, well, as I said, it actually worked. That was already uh, pretty amazing for some of the participants in the project. Um, we were able to actually hook up cloud services, uh, so commercial uh, service providers there. Uh, we have proved the scalability of the concept by adding additional IDPs later on, and they just seamlessly were able to sort of integrate into the project, and that worked as well. Um, and um, we learned that there is still a lot of knowledge to be gained about uh, how you actually deal with these kinds of scenarios in pan-international or pan-European setups. Uh, because even with something like Edugain, which sort of sets a base layer for your trust framework, um, well, there's still a lot of uh, still a lot to learn and, and a lot of to to figure out. Uh, also, because many of the institutions actually are completely oblivious and completely unaware of the fact that something like uh, an interfederation exists at all. Um, second, because um, that was a bit of a challenge for the individual uh, participants of this project, not so much for us. That uh, many of these projects uh, sort of. Uh, the EU projects are done by people totally different from the people who are actually in, in the identity management department. So at some point they come up and go to central IT and say, hey, we want to do interfederation and hook up to service X, Y, and Z. And central IT says, um, yeah, but we still need to update our LDAP. Uh, we have this mailing list service, and after that you can come. Oh, that's the wrong year your grant has already run out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so actually you need to engage with the federation with the institutions and with the central IT from day one to make sure that you can get this, uh, these kinds of projects uh, uh, run and set up. So back to OpenConnect. Um, I will now dive a little bit deeper into the technologies behind it uh, for those of you uh, uh, who are interested in that. Bear with me, it's only six slides, so uh, you don't have to run. Uh, I hope you don't run out of the, of the room. Uh, as I said, federation, uh, SAML uh, attributes, groups, um, some APIs, and a piece of middleware that actually glues all that stuff together. Um, so I'm sort of assuming that everybody in this room is familiar with the concept of an identity federation. OK. <laughs> Basically, an IDP, a service provider, the user tries to get access to the service, in this case, marked with an X. Um, he presses the login button, his browser redirects him to a, to a place called a wave. Where are you from? That's where you actually select the institution you're from. You, the browser redirects you to the login page at your institution. You, provide, you log in, provide your credentials or your certificate or your token or whatever. Um, if that works out, it's okay. The institution sends an acknowledgement to the uh, service provider. Yes, indeed, this is a person that we know. Um, that may be accompanied with a number of attributes, like your first name or your email address or something like that. And at that point, the service decides to let you in or not. Uh, um, um, 
may use the attributes to do additional stuff, like send you email or stuff like that. Um, and actually, this works pretty well. And, and well, this is sort of the, the basic layer for what is uh, an identity federation. SAML is the most used uh, uh, protocol. SAML2, to be exact, is the most used protocol currently in identity federations in research and education. So if your institution is still on SAML1, do something. Um, groups. Any collaboration involves groups. Uh, and with OpenConnect, you can actually do ad hoc or uh, uh, institutional groups. You can facilitate the creation of groups of groups. Um, um, we provide a GUI called Teams, very good name, um, uh, which actually allows end users to manage that stuff. Um, in the back end, we use Grouper, which uh, is a term that should by now be familiar in this, uh, in this room, I think. Um, we actually provide the group membership as a, as a context for the application, so the application can make an, an authorization decision. Um, we only do three roles, and that was a deliberate decision. We know that that is probably not fine-grained enough for most collaborative needs, but um, on the other hand, it is a very, very simple model, uh, which until now has worked pretty well, and we have had no real complaints about people wanting something more difficult than this. Um, and the platform can do something uh, a, a bit odd, perhaps, but very neat, uh, from an, especially from a techie perspective. Um, you can actually make uh, a group of people uh, behave or act from the perspective of the service provider as a virtual identity provider. So that makes that if you have a, a piece of software, a service that can only do SAML and nothing else for some reason, and actually there's a whole bunch of applications out there that have this model. Every enterprise application is basically uh, that model. So the Google App for Education does it, Microsoft uh, 365 does it. Uh, they actually assume that there will be only one connection between the institution, between the identity provider, sorry, and the service provider. Um, that's not very nice if you want to do collaboration, because um, that means that you have to provision everybody in your collaboration into the ID, into the identity provider of the institution. Well, using uh, this virtual identity provider, you can combine groups of people, or you can actually also combine identity providers into one and make sure that they can together access, say, Google Apps for Education. And one scenario that is very common there is uh, the, the identity provider of the institution plus the guest identity provider and have them collaboratively uh, work in Google Docs, which is then owned by the or bought by the uh, institution. Um, well, attributes and group information can be, provide, can be provided at logon, um, and that is true in two, in two directions, actually. You can get these attributes and use these attributes in the platform as they come from the institutions, but you can also add additional attributes and additional group information as uh, you go from the platform to the, to the actual service provider. Um, however, many scenarios uh, require the exchange of attribute information and group membership information out of band, so at logon is nice. But what do you do if you want to do your kickoff meeting um, where nobody has ever logged into this, uh, into this uh, video conferencing system, but you do want to send out the invite for them with the, with the correct link to the, uh, to the, collaborative, to the uh, uh, video conference system? How do you get the email addresses of the people into the system? Uh, well, normally you can't. Um, with this platform, you can actually do that uh, by means of a REST API in this case. Um, we're currently uh, working on implementing Skim as well, and we're planning on doing uh, several attribute support for several attribute queries as well. Um, so there's uh, uh, we're significantly uh, improving the API capabilities of the platform. Um, so when we started to build this platform, we had one very strict uh, rule, and that was we would not build this from scratch. Um, so what we did is we combined a number of existing technologies uh, and only put a bit of glue in between that. So basically, on the SAML side, we took the shibboleth service provider, uh, we took the simple SAML service provider, and we took a product called Corto, which was developed then by the Danish uh, uh, um, National Research and Educational Network provider. Oh, sorry, Wave is the federation operator in Denmark, and the product is called Corto, which means uh, small cup of coffee, like sort of an espresso. Um, that is actually the SAML proxy that, we're, that we were using back then. Uh, for the group stuff, we used a grouper, which you should all be familiar with probably, 
And we used Apache Shindig project, which is the open social, which took care of the open social API <coughs> bits. And uh, well, we, the only thing we actually built on top of Grouper was the Teams application, which because Grouper at that time had no means of doing uh, of inviting people uh, into uh, to become group members. So Grouper back then sort of assumed that it would be a central admin taking care of that. And that has changed by now, by the way. And as a management application back then, we used a tool called Janus, Janus uh, which was also developed by the Danish and by the Danish Federation people. Um, we glued this together, and actually, it worked pretty well. Uh, we started building this in 2009. In 2011, we were in full production, 99.9 uh, .9 production level, uh, service level agreement uh, with our institutions. By now, we have done a bit of redecorating uh, in. in I don't know what color that is, but in the other color, <laughs> the stuff that has changed over time between now and, and 2014. Uh, so uh, the Corto uh, uh, bits uh, in the SAML proxy uh, are now a joint project between SurfNet and Wave. Uh, and, oh, by the way, all the software here is open source. Um, and the other thing we did is we implemented uh, the SAML libraries from the simple SAML product uh, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, because we got sick and tired of maintaining the SAML libraries ourselves. That was way too much work. Um, we scrapped out the Apache Shindig product because um, the actual APIs that we needed were only like three of the APIs out of the 50 that the product actually offers. Um, that was a bit heavyweight for our needs, so uh, we rebuilt that uh, ourselves, uh, but actually rebuilding three APIs when you have a very good idea of what you actually want from these APIs is much easier than building it from scratch when you actually have no clue what you want with them. Uh, we did a revamp of the Teams application mainly to make sure that uh, we can now have uh, much more configurable GUI stuff there. Uh, we have started to adopt uh, Twitter Bootstrap as the, as the dominant GUI uh, for all the applications that are end user facing, making it much easier to sort of rebrand your own version of the, of the software. Um, we have taken care of Janus that was abandoned by the, uh, by the Danish uh, NREN. Um, uh, so we're now managing that open source project. We added another, an additional, very well named uh, management tool called Manage. Uh, we're very good at names, but anyway. Uh, uh, which takes care of a number of the uh, configurational bits that we wanted the web interface for, but we could not put that into the, into the Janus application. Um, and as by 2014, uh, we are taking care of about 22 million logons uh, on a yearly basis. That was 2013. Um, we had to do it to beef up the log handling and the statistics handling uh, of the platform as well. In addition, um, and that is, uh, I think, interesting for, for you guys here, is that we created an OpenConnect virtual machine, which actually allows you to sort of create a demo version of this entire platform in depending a bit on the speed of your of your virtual machine uh, in between 10 to 15 minutes. And this will give you just a playing round where you can do actually all the stuff that you could do with the production level platform as well. Oh, and we added a lot more glue here as well. So to go really, really deep, a, a schematic overview of the platform, two core components, the API component, which is actually the group proxy, uh, and the engine component, which is actually the sample proxy, these work together. Uh, these are linked together via APIs, and both have management interfaces. Uh, over there, the manage application, uh, which is the management interface for the API part, and the service registry, or Janus application, which is the management interface for the engine part. Um, all applications that are end-user facing are uh, on the top of on the, or on the bottom, because they actually are themselves service providers for the platform, as in SAML service providers for the platform. Uh, we provide a, uh, 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 in the virtual machine, we provide a, an identity provider called Mugina, which is, uh, uh, Mugina is a, an old uh, uh, mythical creature in Japanese uh, uh, mythology, which actually means shapeshifter, because uh, the fun of the Mugina service, uh, the Mugina IDP is that you can actually uh, manipulate any and all characteristics of the IDP with a REST API just before you actually do the logon. So you can change things like the attribute set that is being passed on, or the username or the password, but even stuff like its certificate, its entity ID, uh, everything can be managed and, and actually altered on the fly, uh, which makes it a very versatile tool for doing uh, testing and stuff like that, but also to uh, 
yeah, to play with it and to mimic like the situation in your own institution. Um, we also provide a number of open uh, guest IDPs uh, as well, like the FIDE Open IDP, which is run by the Norwegian Enman. Um, you can add in gray, you can add additional group providers. Uh, we support currently the Grouper API uh, and the, the, uh, the Open Social Food API as the default APIs there. Um, and of course, you can add service providers, SAML service providers, and basically you can add any SAML service provider. Uh, in the production platform in the Netherlands, we have by now hooked up over 600. Um, so we're pretty sure that we have covered every bit of uh, uh, awkward sample implementation uh, that we have seen out there. Um, and we actually have hooked up most of, of the big commercials, uh, but ranging down from, say, a default out-of-the-box uh, shibboleth SP, it will all work with this platform. So we get a lot of questions from people who actually uh, as you may have picked up from this one, uh, within the Netherlands we run a so-called Hub and Spoke Federation, where there's actually one central component where everybody connects to, all services and all identity providers are connected to this single instance. Uh, it has a big benefit for all these services and, the, and these IDPs, because you basically only connect once um, and you're done. Uh, no need to do additional configuration. If a new service provider pops up, you don't have to do anything. Uh, except from send us, in this case, the NREN, an email that you want to connect to them, or actually uh, I showed you the service, uh, the, the service app store, and actually that is the place where you can tell us that you want to use the service. Um, of course, there is a sort of a downside to this. Uh, yes, as an institution or a service provider in the Netherlands, you must trust uh, SurfNet. If you, don't, if, you can, if you think or feel you cannot trust this, this is a, not the model that you would want to take, I guess. Um, but that said, um, the same platform works pretty nicely in a uh, mesh federation, which is typically like the, in, the in common federation as well, uh, where it can act as sort of a super service provider or a, su a service provider proxy. Um, and this is a, a picture that I took from uh, Neil Witteridge's uh, presentation. He works for Arnet. Uh, the Australians run a mesh federation very similar to what you have here in the US. Um, and here in green, the, again, the two components of the SurfConnect platform, where you see that the service provider bit of, of engine is sort of half within the Access Federation. Um, I know that I'm now walking out of the picture of the camera, but anyway, so here allowing them to actually hook up uh, the uh, identity providers and, and, uh, and service providers that are in the, in the Australian Access Federation. And over here, the ability to uh, add additional uh, identity providers. Um, this works well because all the services, as well as the proxy, are within control of the same organizational uh, entity anyway. So um, in this case, it doesn't matter if you don't trust the proxy, because you, you cannot <coughs> not trust the proxy and still use their services. Uh, that would not make sense. Um, this model, therefore, also works very nicely for collaborative organizations where there is an implicit trust relation between these organizations uh, to start with. So, to wrap up, how can OpenConnect help you? Um, it allows you to centrally manage and share group information. Um, it provides you uh, with the ability to link external group providers and provide and sort of give the whole set of information to connected service providers. It allows you to centrally manage service and identities, um, in, including uh, access and attribute release policies that you would want to set for these uh, for these services. Um, and it allows you to manage uh, uh, attributes, roles, and rights, so you, that you can actually do authorization. Uh, you can actually manage these attributes, but you can also transform and filter attributes, for example, uh, if you want to do that. And you can also do stuff with group membership. Uh, and you can do this both at logon, so as part of the SAML login, but also uh, when queried out of band. If you want to run something like this yourself, the best way to start is to have a look at the OpenConnect virtual machine. You can find it at GitHub. Uh, and uh, well, uh, if you uh, no, no, not if, but when you have completed the install, uh, you will be welcomed by uh, a screen. That's that one below. It's a CentOS Red Hat setup. Should take about 10, 15 minutes to, to do that. Um, we explicitly recommend to you to not run this in any kind of production setup, because uh, to make it like uh, this integrated thing that you can run on one box, we 
had to do some configurational stuff that would not be very wise to run on production level servers. Uh, but for playing around and running it in a development environment, etc., it's just fine. So if you want some more information, you could either go to the SurfConnect informa information site. Uh, that will also give you some additional videos and, and use cases for the platform. Um, all, of Surf Con all of OpenConnect is hosted at GitHub, the source. Everything is open source. Uh, it's mostly Apache 2 license, uh, except for some of the components that were licensed otherwise. Um, we have some additional applications and support tools. These live in GitHub OpenConnect apps. Uh, we have a community website over at uh, openconnects.org. Um, and we have mailing lists where you can actually ask questions. If you're a dev or a user, we kindly invite you to go there and ask questions. That's basically it. Are there any questions? Is there time for questions? <laughs> No questions? That's good. It was a long time. I was so clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.